Catherine Hayhoe. She is an atmospheric scientist that crunches the data. She analyzes the models and she uh, helps engineers and city managers all over the world and also ecologists to quantify the impacts of climate change. Uh, Catherine Hayhoe, there she is. Hello, Catherine. She is with us from Texas, United States. And Catherine, you will talk about different ways of acting on climate change. Please give her a warm hand. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to participate in this conference virtually, and I hope that it is just the first of many that we do in this way. So I live in the United States, and I am often on social media, on Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and more. And when I am there, I often see things like this. Just a minute. Here we go. I often get comments like this. How are you profiting off this fraud? Or you are crazy. Don't you know that CO2 is plant food? And people often think, well, of course you see these things because you live in the United States. But I'm sorry to say that I look at every single comment I get, and many of them are from Canada, my own country. Quite a few of them are from Australia or the United Kingdom. I see them from people in Norway and Switzerland, even a few from Southeast Asia, and once in a while one from Africa too. But I do live in the United States, and the United States is known as one of the countries where the largest number of people reject the scientific consensus that climate is changing and humans are responsible. This is polling data from last year. Anywhere that is blue means that less than 50% of people agree with the statement at the top. Anywhere that is orange means more than 50% of people agree. And when we look at this, we think, wow, well clearly, people just need more information. Because if you have large areas of the country that are blue, if we just tell them the facts, surely they will change their minds. Well, we did exactly that. I was a lead author on the US National Climate Assessment, which is actually the most up-to-date assessment of the state of the science in the world today, until the next IPCC report comes out. So volume one, which I served as a co-author writing about future scenarios and models and the possibility of unpleasant surprises in the climate system, volume one clocked in at over 400 pages. It was written by 50 different authors and it goes through the science very clearly what's happening in the Arctic, what's happening in the oceans, what's happening to our temperature and our rainfall, our storms, our droughts, our wildfires and more. But at the same time, you can summarize volume one in just one sentence. Climate is change is real, it's us, it's serious. And the window of time to prevent widespread dangerous impacts is closing fast. Did it change minds? These are a few of the headlines that followed the report. The president confuses climate change with weather again. The White House says the dire climate report is based on the most extreme scenarios. When in fact, of course, as all scientists do, we included all scenarios. And of the climate scientists are just driven by the money, despite the fact that we're paid zero dollars to write this report. But when they asked me right after this report was published, they said, do you think this report will change people's minds? I said, no, I don't think it will. If somebody is not already on board or they're disengaged and they feel like it doesn't matter, more information about ocean acidification or attribution is not what will change their minds. Because the biggest problem we have, even in the United States, and if we have this problem in the United States, then clearly I think we have it in many places around the world. The biggest problem we have is not that people think that global warming is not real. This is a map when they ask people, do you think global warming is happening? Almost everywhere in the entire United States, is orange. That means yes. The darker the color, the higher the number. Then you say, do you think global warming will harm plants and animals? Again, everybody says yes. Do you think global warming will harm future generations? You might think these are the same maps, but they're not. They're different maps. The answer again is yes. Everybody says yes. It's real. It will harm plants and animals. It will harm future generations. Do you think it will harm people in developing countries? A little bit more blue, not too much. Do you think it will harm people in the US? Eh, a little bit more blue. And then, do you think it will harm 
us. This is the problem. We don't think it matters to us. And so more information about the science is not what will change people's minds when the number one image that we think of when people say global warming is an animal that very few people have seen in real life. If it's only about the polar bear, why should it matter? Of course, that isn't true. And that's why when we talk about climate change, the first most important thing to talk about is how it matters to us in the places where we live. It matters to us because it supersizes our rain and flood events. When we just look at headlines around the world, we see headlines from a year and a half ago that a third of Bangladesh is underwater. We see headlines that Houston is experiencing its third 500 year flood in three years. We see flash floods in Indonesia, more flooding in the US and the Midwest. This is happening not at the Arctic, not at the Antarctic, but where we live. And that's why climate change matters because it takes naturally occurring risks because of course flood and drought are natural and it makes them worse. We see headlines of drought in Spain, in Syria, in Texas where I live and California. Again, drought is natural, but it is being exacerbated, amplified, made worse by a changing climate. We see even headlines here in Texas about how we are being affected by a changing climate. We see stories about how wildfires in California are breaking records again and again and again, three times in less than a year for the largest wildfire burned. The reason we care about a changing climate is because it takes the risks we already face today and it exacerbates them and makes them worse. So when we talk about a changing climate, we need to talk about how it affects us and the places where we live. And these things are changing today. In a new poll that just came out in January, it showed that the biggest jump has occurred in people's levels of concern about a changing climate. And that's good news, but it isn't enough good news. We also need to talk not just about why climate change matters to us, we also need to talk about what we can do to fix it. We can talk about things that we are doing ourselves, including what we're doing right now. We are having a no-fly, zero-carbon conference. We can talk about how our diet matters, how our choices matter. I love talking about what's actually happening in unexpected places, like churches and universities. What's happening in places like the state where I actually live, where you have entire army bases going clean energy and the first carbon neutral airport in North America. Talking about solutions is so important, but not just solutions where we live, but solutions that work for people around the world. Educating women and girls, clean cook stove projects, biochar, reducing food waste. If food waste were its own country, it would be one of the top greenhouse gas emitters after China and the US. The bottom line is that to fix this thing, we need hope. And for hope, we need to talk about climate change. But when we talk about it, not just talk about the science, talk about why it matters to us and what we can do to fix it. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I know you're still with us, even there, there you are. Um, when you talk to people that do not care, because we all run into pe these people that go, like, they shrug their shoulders and they go, huh. Do you have any good advice? Because I totally share your opinion about talking about all the actions, all the good examples, etc. But how about the ones that are just not really listening? How do we reach them? I do. And in my TED Talk, I talk about more, this in more detail, but the bottom line is just about everyone has values that they need to care, but they have not connected the dots. Mm -hmm. So if they don't care, the first thing we need to do is listen to them, mm. ask them questions, find out what matters to them. Do they care about their children, about sports, about the economy? What do they care about? Mm -hmm. And nine times out of 10, we can connect the dots between what they already care about and a changing climate, Great. they have just not made that connection before. So for more examples, check out my TED Talk.